Paris, 1900. Los Angeles, 2017. Somewhere along the way, we forgot who we are designing cities for. Are we designing cities for people? Or are we designing cities for machines? The world is urbanizing in an unprecedented way. More and more, people want to live in cities, economic and cultural hubs, where the action happens. Places like New York, San Francisco, London, Paris, Shanghai, Hong Kong, Singapore. But there is a consequence to that. As millions of people move to cities, space is becoming scarce and, of course, expensive. But how does that affect you? How does that affect the many people? The young entrepreneur, the single mother, the empty nester, the working class family. How does that affect you? You have to make a choice. You either move as far as you need to from the city center in order to afford a place, think about suburban sprawl, or if you want to stay in the city, you need to downsize in a square footage. As the price of a square foot in places like Boston, San Francisco, or New York is already well beyond $1,000. The problem with those two things, or those two options, is that they both come with compromises. Compromises in your quality of life. In the first one, apart from the fact that it is not the most sustainable way of growing as a city or as a country, you are giving up a precious amount of time through commuting every day. And on the second, of course, you are much more conscious about your footprint, but you are giving up a great amount of functionality. No one really wants to live in a tiny prison cell. What if there was a different way? What if I told you that our conception of a space is wrong? It has actually been wrong for a long, long time. Bigger, larger space does not mean more functionality. That is based in a very old paradigm where we linearly relate the square footage and functionality. The square footage has become that magical number that people used to tell you how much functionality you have. The more square footage, the more functionality. And that is so, so wrong. All square feet is not born equal. And I'm going to prove that to you. We are going to use an example. We are going to use as an example a residential studio apartment. We could have chosen another urban space. We could have chosen an office, a hotel room, a dorm. But let's use a residential studio apartment. Now, I'm not talking about the studio apartment from Sex and the City. Let me bring you back to reality. The typical studio apartment in New York right now looks more like that. And if you are living in one of these apartments, you are probably having one of these three problems, or maybe all of them. Number one, lack of division of a space. That is the main reason why couples don't want to move to studios because it's very difficult to have two counteracting simultaneous activities, like sleeping or watching TV. We even found out throughout our research interesting things like what happens when the couple gets angry. Probably you guessed right. One of them has no alternative but to go to the bathroom. Uh, <laughs> number two, lack of a proper living area or dining area. This is a typical situation in which your studio feels like a hotel room. It feels like a bedroom. And if you want to have you know, a social gathering or a business meeting, not only is dysfunctional, but it becomes pretty, pretty awkward. And number three, lack of storage. Believe it or not, we still have a lot of physical things. And one of the last studies about apartment trends told us that the second most wanted feature in apartments nowadays right after high-speed internet is walking closets. Now, good luck trying to fit a walking closet in a space like that one. 
By the way, these three problems are not things I just invented, but actually the Urban Land Institute published a report that highlighted these very same three issues. But some of you may be thinking now, hey, 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 don't go too fast. Uh, engineers, you know, designers, architects have been thinking about these problems for a long time and are trying to come up with solutions. Indeed, the problem is that all these solutions come with compromises. So the first problem of division of space enter the junior bedroom, a partition wall on a studio. It solves a problem by creating another problem. Because half of the time, when you are not sleeping, your living room just becomes half the size. For number two, lack of a proper living area, welcome back Murphy beds from our grandpa's home. Now, this is a, a good example of something that is great for occasional use for guests, but it's pretty horrible for daily use because it forces you to go through a ritual, through the cognitive load of, tra of transformation, adding steps to your daily lives. And as Jeff Bezos from Amazon said, what people have found over and over again is that when you remove the tiniest friction from daily activities, you make people's lives better. And number three, to the lack of storage, either you build the walk-in closet we talked about, which takes half of your space for only 20 minutes of use, or what developers are building are storage rooms like this one, where you can pay 50, 100, $150 a month for a small storage box like this. So the point here is that old solutions and techniques don't really solve new problems. But what if we could think about a world where spaces, furniture, walls had superpowers? We could go back to the same challenges and think about what could happen or what if your bedroom or your living room could shrink or expand depending on activities. What if you could summon your bedroom or your office or your walk-in closet? What if all of this could happen with just a finger touch or a gesture or voice, mobile phone control? What if all of this could happen even autonomously when a space understands the activities that are happening? What if there could be apps that make your space, your furniture, your walls talk to other smart devices like lights? or thermostats. Think about a new space paradigm where spaces adapt to us and our activities in the most effortless <coughs> and magical way, instead of us adapting to spaces. For those skeptical out there, let me tell you that we are designing these systems like household products, reliable, designed to endure thousands of cycles, even designed to go into manual mode if the power goes down, safe, engineered to stop in any dangerous or hazardous situation, and of course, cost effective, decoupling the robotics from the furniture so we can cost optimize the robotics and allow all kinds of furniture solutions on top, from the very cheap to the very expensive. But what is even better is the fact that this is not a dream, this is not a prototype. This is actually a product that a company called Ori, that my team and I founded from MIT, is launching in the coming months. And as the origin of its name, Origami, we are talking about approachable design that takes different forms and different functionalities with elegance and beauty. But what is even better than that is that I just show you one example. I just show you one product. And one product is not going to solve all the problems of all spaces and all people. We need to go a level deeper. We need to think about tools. We need to think about a kit of parts of robotics, mechanics, electronics, software that allows to create many more solutions, hundreds, thousands of solutions for different space problems. And my team and I got very inspired by what MIT and Lego created a few decades ago. They created a toolkit, brains, muscles, skeletons that were modular 
and that could allow kids to create amazing engineering marvels. So many different possibilities with the same backbone technologies. Now, think about Legos for grown-ups. Think about you, the designer, the architect, the furniture maker, having access to tools, robotic tools, that allow you to create all kinds of solutions. Beds that slide, that drop from the ceiling, tables that move around, even couches that slide like magic carpets. <laughs> solutions that even my team and I haven't even thought about. Think about modular standardized components, thousands of product possibilities. And with those tools in your hands, now you can go back to problems, to urban problems. It's not only the studio apartment in New York City. It can be the family of four people trying to make 400 square feet work in Hong Kong. Or it could be the startup company in New York City that kind of really figure out how to fit 10 people in the space of five. Or the business traveler that goes around the world and would love to have that room double as an office space throughout the day. A new generation of spaces powered by Ori. So in a nutshell, think about urban space being too valuable to be static and unresponsive. Think about all solutions not really solving new problems. Think about what could happen if furniture, walls, spaces had superpowers. Think about modular architectural robotics. Or maybe something a bit more friendly. Think Ori. <laughs> <laughs>